Today, our topic is savings by design. There have been some updates to the commercial program. Um, so we have a, a put together this webinar as an opportunity to learn more about what's changing with the Savings by Design program put on by Enderbridge Gas. And then we thought we would take the opportunity to talk, uh, to have Larry talk about uh, some code updates. So we've got quite a, a packed agenda. Um, I'm just gonna give a brief overview and introduce our, our speakers and then we'll get going. Um, so first we're going to have uh, Vinoth Jagan Mohan from Enbridge Gas, who is the Energy Solutions Advisor for the Commercial and um, Program. He's going to give us an overview of changes to the Commercial Savings by Design Program. Then we're going to have Larry Bryden from Sustainable Buildings Canada give us an update on the the code updates, National Building Code harmonization, um, a whole package of of what's changing with the building code. Then uh, we have Dave Peterson and Josh Lewis, who are going to talk about the integrated design process and integrated project delivery. Um, so uh, we've got a bit of an overview of what happens in the existing program and then um, how can we sort of take that to the next level. And then we're going to wrap things up today with um, Eli Miller, the um, VP of Project Management from Hallmark, with a case study of a project that came through the Savings by Design program and has since become a, a very uh, famous building in the sustainability world, um, the 80 Atlantic project. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm just continually adding some people. We, we, got uh, about 35 people on the call right now. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd urge you to just, um, you can put them into the chat. You should have a, a chat window there or a Q and A box. And otherwise we are going to have sort of question periods throughout the workshop. So if you, you can either write your question into the chat and I will um, ask it for you. Or um, if you have a question, you can say, you, Put that in the chat. I have a question, or you? I think you can request to be unmuted. Yes, we've got a, a recording will be available, so um, we're recording this whole webinar. We'll send out a link um, with the the presentation and links to the projects that are discussed and the link to the recording. Um, so you should receive that hopefully by the end of the day, and if not, um, sometime before the end of the week. And um, we know these webinars are, uh, there's, we're awash in webinars these days, and sometimes you can't stay on for the whole thing. It's good to be able to go back and catch up anything you missed. So as I just admit a few more people here um, from the waiting room, I'm going to hand things over to Vinoth um, to get started on the Savings by Design commercial building program. Thank you, Adam. Hi, everyone. My name is Vinoth Jagamohan. And as Adam mentioned, I'm the Energy Solution Advisor at Enbridge that manages the Savings by Design program. Um, this program has been in the marketplace uh, since 2012, and we've reviewed over 600 buildings um, through the integrated design process. Um, and before I go over and talk about some of the changes to the program as of this year and recently, um, I'll give you a quick high-level introduction um, for those who may not be as familiar. So savings by design is an opportunity for commercial and multi-res um, builders to affordable housing, anything in the part three classification of the building code to have their buildings reviewed uh, by a, a team of subject matter experts, knowledgeable in high efficiency and energy efficient designs. The program is free to participate and it gives you an access to industry ex experts and technical tools um, to develop high performance, resilient buildings. Uh, some of those subject matter experts are gonna be speaking today um, during this presentation. Um, but the process for those who decide to participate is uh, this integrated design workshop is tailored 100% um, towards your project. So the first thing we'll do is an introduction meeting or a visioning call to understand your project goals and make sure that we have the team of subject matter experts available for your workshop um, in order to help you get the best results. So during the visioning, we want to hear about your goals, any, any possible uh, net zero targets or things of that nature that you're looking to achieve so that we can make sure that the workshop really highlights the different ways you're going to get there. During the integrated design workshop, it's a one-day process where we ask your team as well as your 
um, architects and consultants to participate as well. And th during this workshop, we'll review all facets of the building, starting with the envelope and moving on to um, your glazings and active systems and analyze all of the different energy conservation measures um, that you could possibly consider with this. Adam, can you go to the next slide? <clears throat> For savings by design, uh, we set a target of at least 25% better than SP10 um, as a minimum, as, an, as the energy conservation measures that we're going to review will yield that result. Uh, for participants participating in the Toronto area where the TGS is applicable, um, we set a 10% stretch target on that because uh, it is a lot more stringent than SP10 in order to ensure that you're able to get something else out of the workshop as well. Um, although the workshop does have a large energy focus, um, we can think of other sustainable considerations such as durability, constructability, water efficiency, environmental impact, health and well-being, health and well-being, and resilience, as all of these are important considerations as well when you're designing your buildings. Uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> a case study that we wanted to go over with you, you guys is to talk about the condominium that was built at Royal Port. Now, this condominium um, was built by Ramondo and Associates, the architect. And they had participated in savings by design to really understand what all of their different options are. Um, when you're working in the high rise market, when you look going from envelopes to glazing, there's so many different options available in the marketplace with new technology coming out every year. And this is where it's really good to have um, an expert energy model, all of these items. So you can really understand the performance impact and the other qualitative things to be considered of when you're going through it with us. Um, Part of the savings by design workshop is to really analyze all of your different options as we understand that getting to a sustainable building is not a one size fit all and there's different pathways and different systems available for different developers and different needs so we really want to explore this during the workshop can you go next slide Adam? now um, at this building they were really able to get to their targets um, by focusing on <laughs> all of the, um, focusing on their mechanical systems as well as their envelope and glazings um, when they reviewed. In order to get to their target of $17,000 saved, um, they really explored and implemented a best-in-class exterior wall assembly, um, a high-performance centralized HVAC and ventilation system, as well as HRVs and HR ERVs um, for corridor ventilation. This eight-story building was able to save about 28% um, better than Ontario building code, and we're, we're able to reduce uh, 85,000 kilograms of CO2. Uh, next slide, please. So for savings by design, um, as I mentioned earlier, there is two streams and the stream I, I'm representing is the commercial or multi residential. This is for part three buildings, and that's for anything greater than 25,000 square feet is able to participate. We also have a savings by design stream for affordable housing. Um, they're also, it's the same workshop is applied to our affordable housing customers. Um, there's just uh, a couple of additional incentives that are brought forward. For commercial, uh, the commercial savings by design, uh, recently, we implemented a $4,000 participation incentive, and this participation incentive is to offset the cost for your consultants and your team uh, having to attend this one-day workshop. We understand that there's a cost associated with that, so this uh, incentive was brought forward to mitigate that cost. The Savings by Design workshop, uh, we value it at about, it, it is about $30,000 in cost. That is um, required to implement this program, but it is free for your, the customers to participate. Um, and it is a limited time offer. So uh, we do run this program on an annual basis, but we wanted to reach out to make sure uh, that everyone is aware. Can you move to the next slide, please. Um, now to be eligible for the for savings by design, um, there's a couple of criteria. The first is you need to have a part three building uh, either new or a large renovation is taking place. 
The building must be at least 25,000 square feet or larger gross area. Um, as a target, we're going to show you how to get to at least 25% better than Ontario Building Code SB10 efficiency for most projects. The target um, is, is a educational target where you are not required to have your buildings meet this. We hope that you do um, design to a higher efficiency, but you're not required to have your buildings uh, meet that 25% above Ontario Building Code. You'd also be need to be located in the Enbridge Gas Service Territory, which almost all of Ontario is, and at the design stage or earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now I'm just gonna go over three key case studies uh, from recent participants in the program. And the first is Southfield Community Center in Caledon. Um, <clears throat> This, um, <clears throat> this location provides both recreation and opportunities to meet um, the broader social needs of the residents. The center offers many, many amenities, including uh, a two tank swimming pool, community hub spaces, a early on center, a public library, a fitness facility, and an OPP community police office. So as you can see, there's a lot of different uses in this building um, and to design a high efficiency building, we're, some of the key enhancements that were implemented were energy and heat recovery ventilators, uh, high efficiency fans, uh, enhancing the glaze, glazing and shading uh, ratios for this building, as well as high performance windows and a drain heat, heat water recovery system. And next slide, please. Uh, the next project is Reina Condos. This building um, is unique. From construction management to engineering to architecture, the entire leadership team for this project was uh, behind Reina Condos was a woman-led team, uh, first in Canadian condo development history. This unique group, this uh, this unique group, is rethinking uh, the typical condo with a mixed-use residential building in South Etobicoke, which has a very large merging family-friendly neighborhood. In order to get to their performance that you see below. Um, they implemented high performance heat pumps, high efficiency condensing boilers and energy recovery ventilators, um, lighting controls, energy efficient fixtures, and low flow floating fixtures, low flow water fixtures. Uh, next one, please. And the last example is Ottawa Catholic School Board. Uh, par participating in Savings by Design has been a key part of OC. SB's long-term energy management strategy. Each school um, is a single story, 50,000 square feet with a gymnasium that's also used as a community space in the evenings. And Ontario Catholic School Board is uh, unique because as a builder, developer, and physically responsible board, their design decisions are directly correlated to their annual operating budgets. So energy efficiency is uh, at the top of their priorities to lower their operating costs. Um, they were able to, for this school, they were able to achieve their targets by improving the thermal efficiency of a boiler to 85%, enhancing wall and roof insulations, replacing windows with solar heat gain coefficients increased to 0.54, and upgrading rooftop unit furnaces to, um, to modulate burners. This was actually a retrofit project, and they were actually able to save about $30 million of avoided energy costs since 2004. Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, that was it. Um, did anyone have any questions for me? There will be another question point, but any questions at this time? Thank you, Vinoth. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can, I believe you can request to be unmuted, or you might be able to unmute yourself and ask a question, or type it in the chat. And um, I will just note um, that uh, the Reina condo project, we also had a um, a really interesting video made of that process um, because it was a, it was a fascinating team. Uh, as you said, all women design team from start to finish. Um, and I think that video might be on our YouTube channel. So um, I'll, I've made a note uh, to add that to our distribution list is, on the email you get, I'll include that link to that video for everyone. Thanks, Adam. All right, thanks, Fana. Let's, um, if 
we'll give everyone a chance uh, to put questions in the chat. We also have a few other question periods built into the the webinar today. Um, so I think what we'll do is we will move on and ask uh, Larry Bryden um, to take over and give us an update um, on building codes. All righty. Morning, everyone. My, uh, as Adam said, my name is Larry Bryden. I'm part of the program's delivery team, and I'm Sustainable Buildings Canada's Code SME, or subject matter expert. So, I've been asked today to give you an overview of the Canadian and provincial energy codes today. I'd like to begin with the harmonization and the significant impact that that's having not only on provincial building codes, but also with the process of developing building and energy codes. So the provinces and the territories have all agreed to adopt a harmonized building code through the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change. So they've agreed to adopt a net zero energy ready new construction by 2030 and to improve the energy efficiency of existing housings and buildings. So they propose to do this by adopting carbon reduction and energy, <clears throat> excuse me, and increased energy efficiency requirements through the adoption of existing codes for new buildings and the introduction of retrofit codes for existing buildings. So greater harmonization with the national model codes is supposed to help to maintain the competitiveness, or competitiveness of Ontario's construction sector and to reduce interprovincial barriers for manufacturers and distributors of building materials, systems, and components. Uh, next slide, Adam. Same on here. So through the introduction of a new act, uh, the Ontario Regulation 163-24, Ontario has adopted the National Building Code 2020. However, they have amended it to include the uh, Ontario Amendments document, which amongst uh, other administrative changes to various sections, strips out the energy efficiency requirements of NBC 936, which is sort of our part nine, and uh, NECB 2020 and replaces them with the current version of the Ontario Building Code Part 12 2017 version. So this continues to require compliance with the current supplementary standards in effect today, so SV10 and SV12. So Ontario's carbon and peak electricity requirements are added to Part 12 now while the alternative compliance paths that include ASHRAE 90.1 2013 and NECB 2015 today continue in force as well. Um, these will stay in place until the next code iteration. So the province has chosen not to adopt the tiered codes approach at this point. However, Caledon released its municipal green standard this week referencing MBC 2020 tier three as its minimum requirement. So although the province has not adopted the tiers, you can expect that municipalities will start adopting them to meet their own policy objectives as, uh, as Caledon recently has, and as they were originally um, planned to be implemented. Um, next slide, Adam. So the most significant changes to NBC 2020, or the Part 9 part, include the adoption of the tiered compliance paths for both the prescriptive and the performance path. So the prescriptive path now includes a point-based trade-off approach, much like the Energy Star for Homes program. So you have a base building package, and then you are required to achieve a minimum number of additional points through a point checklist to achieve each individual tier. So the tiered energy performance path uses energy simulation modeling to demonstrate compliance using a better than code or an improvement over target metric. 
So additionally, you're required to achieve a Teddy Lake metric by demonstrating a percentage heat loss over the tier one or the reference building, as well as demonstrating that the peak cooling load of the reference building does not exceed that of the proposed building. So volume of conditioned space determines the actual energy targets to be achieved, um, plus or minus 3, 000, uh, 300 cubic meters of, uh, of home volume. So the performance path provides the most flexibility currently as the point-based system for prescriptive compliance has, still has a limited number of ECMs with uh, corresponding points, uh, ECMs being energy conservation measures. So proposed changes to the 2025 version of NBC include additional measures. So this includes drain water heat recovery, improved air tightness levels, and improved efficiencies of furnaces and things that you will now have um, points assigned to for the prescriptive path. Uh, next slide, please. So within the National Energy Code for Buildings or NECB 2020, significant changes fall into several categories as I've listed on this particular slide. So most significantly, NECB is extended to include alterations and change of use to existing buildings, much like the OBC um, sections 10 and 12. Whole building air tightness has been added as an energy conservation measure where it didn't exist before, as well as the maximum allowable thermal resistance of walls and windows has been reduced, while the lighting power density has been updated. Previous HVAC trade-off options have been eliminated. Basically, they're rarely used anyways, so no big deal. And the performance requirements for both HVAC and water heating equipment have all been updated more to align with, uh, with U.S. standards across North America. So the most significant change, however, is again the addition of a new Part 10, which includes an alternative compl compliance path for incorporating four tiers of performance beyond reference energy targets. Within NBC or the part nine residential sector, there's five tiers. So again, as in NBC 936, the performance path allows the most flexibility, including air tightness testing as an ECM that is not in the previous prescriptive path. So the higher tiers will require performance path modeling. So I'll move on to what we are anticipating coming down the pipes in the uh, 2025 national code. So the next iteration of building codes and bear in mind that these are all proposed changes currently under consultation. So these may or may not become uh, um, part of the national building codes or the national energy codes going forward in uh, 2025 or 2027, whenever they actually make it out the gate. So the National uh, Codes Commission continues with its work to achieve a net zero ready building code by 2030. And it's currently out for public consultation with their third round of proposed changes. So changes proposed include increased accessibility requirements, an exterior lighting update, part load thermal performance characteristics for HVAC equipment and boilers. So climatic data is, a going, is again going to be updated for climate change. There's going to be a new requirement for EFS installations, along with new modeling requirements to account for all thermal bridging. We're expecting a maximum solar heat gain coefficient for windows, again, a climate change mitigation strategy. As well, air tightness requirements are going to be harmonized around a single unified standard where currently two or three are being employed. So Adam, uh, last and final slide, please. So there are general administrative changes that are coming to all the sections to include existing buildings. While the greenhouse gas objectives and functional statements will be added in a new part addressing operational carbon with emissions intensities defined for primary fuel sources 
and the provincial grid intensities with embedded carbon being pushed back potentially to the 2027 code review cycle. So we'll see operational requirements coming in the next iteration, followed by um, more embedded carbon in the following cycle. We should also see the introduction of absolute metrics. So uh, an EUI uh, being introduced as an alternative compliance path. And the code will also look to address climate change and overheating through a maximum room air temperature requirement for dwelling units. So that pretty much concludes my summary. Um, are there any questions now or we can hold them for the uh, Q&A session? Thanks, Larry. That was a that was a really succinct and effective overview. Um, I was I, asked to be succinct. <laughs> it was perfect. Um, so there, it was very high level. If anyone has any questions, if there's anything in particular that um, jumped out um, in what Larry covered that you'd like, maybe a little bit more detail, um, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, I have a question about existing buildings. Given the deep retrofit money that's available now, are these now tied to uh, when we improve an existing building uh, as these uh, codes like uh, building envelope and air tightness? Um, so that is projected in the um, 2025 national codes. To, so there are uh, PCFs that address that. So PCFs are proposed change forms. And those changes uh, um, are expected to be implemented throughout all sections in uh, in the 2025 iteration. So yes, that would address it. And it would be very much like the um, part 10 and part 11 of the Ontario Building Code that we have existing. So we already have them in the Ontario Building Code and they are looking to put similar language into the National Building Code. Well, I think the holistic approach to the building envelope be then sizing the heat pumps is what we need to look at. Yeah, they have put a Teddy uh, 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 metric into um, the general tiers levels as well. So I think you're going to see more of that envelope first approach. However, um, you know, builders are very adept at uh, optimizing for cost effectiveness. So given that um, things like uh, air source, ground source, and water source, heat pumps have such a significant impact on overall building performance, the sort of gigajoule per dollar um, still the value propositions will still lay within the mechanical systems at this point from a straight return on investment perspective. I agree, except you can now improve the existing building envelope instead of replacing windows and, and, and skating and scaling the, the third skin layer on a building. But thank you. Yeah, as they mentioned in, in sort of um, the NOS earlier presentation, there's a whole slew of different um, combinations of measures and that's where the real value to the C, um, savings by design program is is that um, uh, the developer gets a, a second um, subject matter expert design team's eyes on their uh, their particular project while that entire program is focused on a building as a system approach All right, thanks, um, David and Larry. Any other questions? Um, I'll give everyone sort of uh, a, a minute here, a moment, let's say. Um, just um, unmute yourself if you have a question. And then we'll move on. All right, well, it looks like uh, no one else is uh, looking to jump in right now, Larry. Uh, so thank you very much. And if you stay on, there might be some questions a little bit later as well. Uh
I can't tell if I have frozen or if everyone else has. So I'm going to continue here. So as we've talked about the integrated design um, process, you see that um, the, the purpose of integrated design is is sort of in, in our case, sort of uh, subsumed under the idea of sustainability. But as Larry explained, it's becoming more and more a part of the regulatory framework that we're operating in is uh, to include sustainability metrics. To take these things into account is required um, in many methods of design. So the reason why we uh, appreciate and encourage people to use the integrated design process is that it's as much a design process as it is a design philosophy. The goal of it is to do much of the heavy lifting up front, to do the as much of the, the questions and work out as many of the problems of the entire building lifespan at the outset of the design process rather than at the end. So in this case, using energy modeling, we are able to account for design changes that uh, may have a big impact on cost and on uh, constructability. We can compare different active systems and envelope systems, window systems um, with each other to determine which ones are the most effective. And we can do this in a way that allows us to sort of minimize the overall cost by testing them using the energy model. There are a lot of benefits to using integrated design and one of those benefits is often that we can lower operating costs. So it's not entirely about sustainability, though that's the angle that we take on it. It is um, generally using the integrated design process means you can test out different methods of building operations and determine which of those will reduce the energy consumption from the building, which obviously can reduce operational costs. We also can use that to reduce GHG emissions throughout the lifespan of the building, but also through embodied carbon, which is becoming more and more um, important within the building system. So we've got two experts here um, who have a lot of uh, expertise in both their, um, their domains within the building systems, but then also with integrated design. So Dave Peterson from Outside In Design Build and Josh Lewis from Nerva Energy um, are going to speak more to the integrated design process and how they use it. Um, so what I'd like to do here is just call on Dave Peterson first um, to give us a, some examples of how he uses IDP. Thanks, Dave. Just go back one slide for a second. Let's table a couple Absolutely. of changes. So um, yeah, my name is Dave Peterson, outside in design build. Um, I've been connected to this process since uh, 2010, use it in my own practice, but it was introduced to me through the Sustainable Buildings Canada group, uh, specifically through the co-founders of the process and the one that we use in Savings by Design through Niels Larson and Bob Bache. Um, transformative at that time, back in 2010, when we weren't working sort of as teams and very often we, again, compartmentalized and tried to figure out challenges after the fact, this was a real eye opener for me. Um, and since uh, those days I've done several hundred of these workshops with um, both clients through Savings by Design, which started in 2012, as well as in my own practice. Um, so just, I'll take you through some of the things that I've noted in terms of the takeaways and synergies that, uh, that I see, and, and maybe the interactions and how this really sort of plays out if, if you haven't actually uh, participated or been part of an IDP workshop, uh, this might sort of table some of the the takeaways here and, and um, let's start with some common elements in terms of the system. So first of all, it's not a one size fits all program. It does have a lot of flexibility again, based on common elements in terms of setting goals. And these goals can be set by the owner, um, by key players in this. And very often we do see these goals change or morph over time over the process itself. Simply that we're expanding the range of opportunities that we're looking at, looking at pros and cons, uh, uncovering stones, so to speak. To better understand, I think, the synergies of, of the project and the overlap with, with other trades, other systems in terms of really looking at, at key components. Very often we do get 
sort of mantled with that sort of energy cloak and suggest that that's what we're focusing on carbon very often as well nowadays. But realistically, we can expand that viewpoint and, and sort of cover the occupants in the building. I think that's really important to understand that it's a whole building focus, energy and occupants and other components that are important to the proponents in this case that we can build into this process and bring the right people, get the right people on the bus to be able to sort of describe and explain these things. Um, we are connected certainly to low energy building best practices. I think most of you have seen this sort of inverted triangle on the right of the slide, specifically looking at passive versus active systems and then looking at gener uh, generation or procurement of energy through renewables or, or through um, um, gas or, or electricity. Um, and we certainly use this as sort of a guideline, but we fine tune within that. Um, certainly we need to be empirical. So the energy modeling is a core component here, not just energy modeling specifically, which really helps inform us of, informs us of sort of where we can reduce our energy uh, targets, where our carbon is, but also looking at, at durability through that lens using hydrothermal analysis. These are important considerations in terms of life cycle of the building itself, as, as Adam mentioned, and not just the carbon component, but as an owner operator, does it make sense to spend and to detail buildings to extend their life cycle, especially if we're only going to operating them and paying for maintenance downstream. These are really interesting sort of lenses, again, that we can overlay um, using the process to determine what um, best practices might be or key components might look like. Um, the, again, I'm mentioning one size um, certainly doesn't fit all here. Um, we do see some different sort of approaches. Uh, Bill Reed is the other guy that I kind of follow. He's an architect uh, in the US that has a slightly different approach at, at um, IDP. Um, really interesting stuff, though, and, and again, very client centric, um, very sort of collaborative, again, with key people. And these definitions go back to the early 2000s. So as I'd mentioned, this is certainly not a new process. But I find that although I've done hundreds of these in um, through my practice and, and connected with uh, Savings by Design, that each of them is different. Each of them evolves and builds upon the ones previous and those experiences especially as an SME, really sort of connect to the to the overall outcomes of these workshops. Um, Adam, could you move to the next one, please? So I'm just going to overlay a couple of things. And I work very closely with Josh, who's going to be discussing um, IDP and, and IPD in, in, in the next couple of minutes. In terms of sort of our specialties, I focus on the enclosure with a, with a specialty in fenestration design. Um, we do often really focus on these things almost in a vacuum. And this is the challenge, I think, in our industry in terms of, um, you know, low bid um, or the ABC method of, of sort of procurement. We miss a lot of the synergistic connections. And so very often we overlay these components. So as an example, and I'll use some examples in terms of how we might approach this from a passive and active overlay perspective. Um, as an example, from a fenestration design perspective, we often look at daylight design. And not just in terms of looking at cost of energy specific to lighting power densities, which often are ranked quite highly up there in terms of cost or energy use and then cost of energy as well, but they certainly connect with the occupants in the space. So if we can use daylighting design, use natural lighting, there are benefits obviously to the energy use of that building, it's carbon intensity. There are overarching benefits in terms of also the occupants in that space, connecting them to not just natural light, but views, and these connect to our circadian rhythm. So, very often there's another facet here that we can overlay this discussion on that really impacts the people in the space, the reason we're building these uh, buildings. Um, the other key one that we see very often, which can create some real challenges is passive ventilation. Um, I'm a fan of this, obviously, the control aspect for the occupants of a building I think is critically important. The challenge is if we don't get this right in a passive building approach where we might use um, natural ventilation in the shoulder seasons especially, to um, reduce or remove the requirement for energy to condition the space often creates a challenge downstream where the occupants may leave a window or door open. Now we're actually fighting with the mechanical system design. And so understanding these challenges and looking at possible solutions, not just education of, of the, the tenant or, or the occupant of the space, but we do have sort of systems that work together and really sort of harmonize with passive and active approaches are things that can be explored uh, in these models. Um, comfort is key in this as well, and so that overlay, again, in terms of not just the energy portion of the building, but looking at the occupant comfort, not just today, this building is going to be around for the next 60 or 80 years, are important considerations, in my opinion. So, as an example, we might look at um, balancing solar heat gain coefficients, and this is something that Larry mentioned 
finally, after many years of focusing on high solar gain and free energy from the sun, we're really understanding that this is a double-edged sword as well. Uh, we want to balance the amount of solar energy in uh, versus comfort versus, you know, again, a holistic connection with the mechanical system design, the cost of that, and the carbon intensity of those components. And this is all sort of related back to that. Very often we look at, again, cost or low cost alternatives, things like changing solar heat gain coefficients in your glazing are a fairly inexpensive way of really fine tuning that performance. Um, we overlay that though with discussions specific to building integrated or building applied shading. Those are also similar ways of achieving uh, this similar, similar comfort uh, component, but at different cost, different constructability requirements and really laying out these options for the owner to look at, to get a sense of what makes sense for them, how this connects to the mechanical discussion. Can we actually right size the mechanical system design? Can we reduce its design or its distribution to be more efficient? And that's sort of that overarching discussion that we have. TGS requires us now to look at TEDI or thermal and um, uh, uh, TEDI numbers or metrics um, to balance the enclosure of the passive systems with active that we don't just plug in play mechanical solutions that we also look through the lens of resilience. Um, and IDP has always been, I think, really an impactful tool to really sort of unpack those components, sort of lay them out and see what, uh, what happens from an energy perspective. Um, Adam, next slide, please. So the other component that, and this is where probably most of my learning has been, the connection with active and passive systems has so, sort of always been uh, my approach. It's been in my ethos and how I, 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 I work with my clients. One of the biggest takeaways that I would suggest um, in my experience with this program is that the human factor is something that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle when we're focusing on energy intensity or carbon. Um, very often, again, we forget about the occupants in the buildings and the benefits to them really have to be discussed as part of this. And very often it's interesting, it's almost um, counterintuitive in that we may look at things like, as an example, patio door systems. If we have a balcony on a building and we want people to use it, we have to think about the potential of certain parts of our demographic that may not be able to use this as, as um, in terms of, of uh, a disability, pain disability, mobility disabilities, all these different challenges that we have um, with an aging demographic. And we often focus on performance. We look at air tightness. We look at water management strategies. We look at efficient design, sliding doors or sort of, you know, check those boxes in, in every case, except the accessibility component. And so if we're gonna actually build and design buildings that are accessible to their occupants, including outside spaces, very often we're relegated moving away from those systems, which are constructible, cost-effective, um, manage air and water very efficiently to maybe systems that aren't quite as efficient, such as a hinge door, um, because they allow the occupants to actually utilize that space. And sort of overlaying those discussions can sometimes really, um, in, my, in my opinion, be one of the bigger impacts that come out of these IDP sessions. Um, Co-changes that Larry mentioned too, we are taking those into account. So very often again, accessible design or universal design, uh, now part of the national building code are going to stipulate certain and fairly sweeping changes if they're brought in um, in January of 2025 that include components such as operable window systems and how easy they are to operate. Not just focusing on things that we typically look at in the industry as air tightness, um, as part of a whole building air tightness strategy that save energy but looking at the ergonomics specifically. So taking this into account, um, again, sometimes changes the approach. Now, we can still have very airtight window combinations that are easily accessible with people with pain disabilities. So very often exploring these a bit further, um, you know, sharing this with, with other experts um, can sometimes really still find a solution that works in every case. Um, we just now become much more specific in that design. So just a couple of the takeaways in terms of things that I would share with, with the team, if you're interested in connecting to this integrated approach, um, these are some of the things that we would look to. Um, Josh? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so Adam, next slide and we'll kick this off. So I'm going to flip this around. Some of what I'm going to say is going to be uh, kind of repeating what Dave said, but we're going to flip this around from a mechanical perspective. So, you know, first, let's think about where we're going in terms of mechanical systems within buildings as we are on this path now to, you know, net zero carbon, right? So the first thing I'd like to get across is, you know, really the practical options for mechanical systems are, are well-defined and stable. We are looking at some incremental improvement that's occurring on the, in the industry, 
primarily focused around heat pumps and their efficiency, their coefficients of performance, especially on the air source side. And, you know, we do expect to see better and better air source heat pumps uh, over the next, you know, 5, 10, 15 plus years. Um, but the reality of it is we shouldn't be waiting for that to do at least a partial or significant decarbonization of our buildings. We can do that today and then kind of get ourselves in the place where, you know, in the 2040, in the decades of the 2040, we can make the final switch to, to zero carbon. So, you know, message there, let's, let's, not, let's not be waiting to make the transition because if we're all looking for a magic device, it's not really coming. Uh, certainly on the way out, our last generation primary heating systems, you know, where the boilers, CHP, district steam, there's really no way to make these uh, in, in uh, you know, low or zero carbon on mass scale. So these are turning more into backup systems now. But what is becoming more commonplace today on our path to decarbonization is first measures that reduce total building load. And this is really important because we have to optimize before we convert. Because if we don't do that, we're going to be oversizing our new heat pumps. That's going to lead to excess capital costs. Uh, the other part that that'll drive, that's also going to drive higher electrical demand to the buildings to run these heat pumps or, or other electrified systems. And we have to be, we, 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 we know we have to grow the electricity grid, but we have to be uh, careful about how we do that. And we need to minimize load a, a, on the grid as a whole. So definitely becoming commonplace. We're seeing a lot more heat recovery on the air side of buildings. So trying to capture every last bit of heat and cooling out of any exhaust air that we're taking out of the building. Ductwork sealing is becoming a very common measure to reduce the, uh, the inefficiencies of leakage in the ductwork system. Uh, ultra low flow water fixtures, uh, those save both obviously water usage, but also save heating energy for water, especially things like shower heads. Um, and Energy Star appliances, right? Um, you know, Energy Star appliances for for residential uh, for residential buildings, uh, great low cost uh, uh, upgrade to save a little bit of energy. But also too, as part of this optimization first, before we start, you know, fully converting to zero carbon heating, is definitely advanced controls. We we need our buildings to be smart. We need our buildings to be efficient. We need our buildings to be constantly monitoring themselves. And, 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 and figuring out, uh, you know, when they're falling out of the expected operation band. So, you know, when I talk about advanced controls, we're talking about occupancy sensors, uh, forced user limitations on things like set points, um, optimum start of buildings after they've come out of deep setback mode in the, uh, in the evenings, like when they're unoccupied, uh, CO2 demand control ventilation. Um, I mean, that's not a new technology, but we need to do a lot more of it uh, and we need to do it a lot better in order to drive down loads. Uh, deep setbacks, I already mentioned, especially, you know, mostly for buildings that are not occupied at night. Uh, looking at interior load reset for mechanical plant systems rather than using outdoor temperature, much more efficient. Uh, but also real time metering built into these systems uh, to, you know, meter individual parts of systems, individual pieces of equipment, combined with continuous fault detection commissioning to to really you know really make the building uh not just efficient but constantly monitoring its own efficiency uh to make sure that if something does go out of range in terms of total energy consumption in terms of the way that a particular system is operating there's immediately alarms generated so that that, that out of band condition can be dealt with um, and also demand response and that and that kind of goes to the grid interactivity of buildings where you know, we do need to build out the electricity grid as we decarbonize, but we need to, the, our, our buildings, we can only build the grid so far. So we need to do more systematic demand response uh, integration of our buildings to the grid so that especially on those peak hot summer days, which are only going to get hotter, our buildings can look, drop their cooling load and their electrical load if we're approaching the, the peak demand of the grid. Um, now, other things, obviously, they're gaining traction in the market, certainly heat pumps, which are becoming more and more the primary uh, heating systems. Typically, what we're seeing today is more hybrid configurations where we're still having natural gas for peak or backups. But even in that type of setup, uh, you know, you're, you can still decarbonize a building's operation now, you know, anywhere between, say, 50 to 80 percent 
even with using the gas as only for the peak loads or the backup loads. So, so that is kind of what we expect to see more of over the next uh, decade or two before we get the full decarbonization down the road. Uh, other things uh, that people may or may not be aware of is certainly heat recovery on the drain water. That's something we've kind of never systematically done. Uh, we are doing it now in single family homes, but we need to do it really across all buildings. Um, that's, that's a heat source that we've typically missed. Uh, also reduced uh, ventilation and pressurization of buildings, uh, especially in the multi-residential space. A lot of that is tied to also having more airtight building envelopes and super efficient lighting designs. Uh, that's less of a carbon measure in Ontario, but you know, driving down lighting power densities while still having great lighting uh, for the occupants of the building. Next slide. Now, when we look at driving those successful outcomes in terms of new buildings or deep retrofits of buildings, right? You know, Dave, Dave, Dave was clear on this message. We need to optimize the building envelopes first to drive as much performance as cost effectively possible. And then we need to design the mechanical electrical systems, whether it's new or retrofit, to fit the envelope. And we got to stop avoid sizing on rules of thumb. We used to be able to do that in the world where, you know, we were primarily heating and cooling buildings with boilers and chillers or, you know, gas fired rooftops with DX cooling. We could oversize. The cost implications on that, on those systems weren't, weren't that bad. But when we get into the world of heat pumps, uh, you, you, you oversize and your capital costs uh, start, to, start to drag down on your ability to, to execute these types of projects. So we need to get our heads more around that. And, you know, you can see here under solving the cost equation here, I'm not going to read each of those lines, but essentially, if we improve the building envelope, it leads to lower heating cooling demands, then we can get into smaller systems, less energy input required, greater passive thermal resiliency, and all of these have benefits, right? Um, that, that can be, in a lot of cases, financialized into a pro forma to, in order in order to allow the project to proceed. So, you know, this, this is where the integrated design process really comes into play because without using integrated design where, you know, all the team is sitting at the table equally, the architect, the engineer, the cost consultant, the constructor, the energy modeler, and all the other support, Otherwise, you know, we end up with roadblocks where we're designing in, sol in silos, there's no coordination methodology, we're kind of designing sequentially the building, like starting with the envelope and the massing and the orientation and then moving into the mechanical systems rather than doing them in parallel. Um, and, and, you know, in, in, in that type of, in the traditional type of process we use, which, you know, I'll term here as design, bid, build, which is kind of the typical construction process, we, 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 we end up with these roadblocks that don't lead us to an optimal outcome. And that's where in the integrated design process solves this. Um, also, from, a, you know, a construction perspective, uh, we're going to start running into some real issues here, especially in Toronto, but also other jurisdictions like Mississauga, Caledon, and other jurisdictions which are adopting above code uh, green performance standards. Um, we, we, you know, building envelopes are going to get expensive, um, you know, when they get high performance, uh, you know, we, with the workforce skill in that area is certainly decreasing as it is across all the construction trades. So we need to use integrated design more and more for projects in order to get over these humps, uh, in order to design the building in parallel, uh, in, in, in order to do all the balances between cost, constructability, uh, and energy and greenhouse gas performance. Next slide. So if we look at this more holistically, though, like we all, you know, we've been introduced here to savings by design. We know that's, a, you know, a one day charrette for, you know, any any uh, for new buildings in Ontario to get this third party input. That that's a that's a level of, you know, integrate the integrated design process. But if we if we flip the acronym IDP around and turn it into IPD or integrated project delivery, this is more holistically where we need to go. Um, and, and there are, and I'm going to talk about a case study here in a couple slides, but 
This is not unknown to the market, but has never been highly adopted. Typically, like I said, we're doing design bid build, which follows under the CCDC 2.5 types of contracts. But we have CCDC 30 now. I believe that was actually formalized uh, as uh, in 2018 in order to do integrated project delivery of new buildings and deep retrofits, where there's a lot more consultant work up front, but there's a lot less uh, changes and upsets in the construction phase. And ultimately, I, IPD generally leads, uh, in almost all cases, to better buildings at a lower cost. Next slide. So one of the messages I'd like to get across though, uh, certainly to any developers who are on this call, but definitely architects is the architects are kind of in a unique position compared with most other consultants on a lot of projects because they're typically the first consultant on board. And what that means is that, you know, they have a wide range of roles, obviously across the project that kind of extend from, you know, like the earliest kind of concept to all the way through closeout. Um, but, they're in this position where we, they can have influence over the owner or developer to suggest that we can do an IPD or an integrated project delivery process under CCD 30 rather than going down the design bid build methodology, right? And I mean, why, why do we need to do this as an industry? Well, you know, we don't really know how to systematically design and build cost-effective, high-performance, passive house-like envelopes on tall buildings. So we simply we simply don't have a cost effective solution for that right now. Yet we realize that by 2028 in Toronto with the Toronto Green Standard, we're only building a uh, building envelopes at a passive house level. So we have to over we have to overcome that as a whole industry. Um, we certainly need to coordinate on energy and carbon performance at the earliest stages of the design. And when I mean that, like I'm even talking about how the building is rotated on the site, like some fund fundamental decisions, which can make a huge impact on overall performance. Um, and we've got to start to give full consideration to innovative design and construction practices like modular, prefabrication, low carbon and advanced materials, passive, uh, passive strategies for heat gain and ventilation, uh, 3D printing, uh, BIM, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and adaptive reuse. The problem is, is that in the typical design bid build methodology, it's very difficult to, at any point in the process, to give full consideration. But if we're doing integrated project delivery under a CCC, CCDC 30 type of contract, um, I, I would go as far to say that like uh, that team, uh, comprehensive team would, some, would be somewhat negligent if they didn't consider at least do a high level consideration of all these things you see here which are innovative construction practices that are gonna help de uh, design, help us design and construct uh, better buildings faster at a lower cost. Um, so, you know, if, if there is any architects on the call and anybody else who has, you know, direct contact with owners, developers, you know, let's become IPD experts and champions. And from the earliest engagements, let's educate our clients why that uh, the I, I, an, uh, an IPD process might be the best uh, way forward for any particular uh, building. Next slide. So case study here is my last slide before uh, before we get to the uh, to Eli. But um, let's use uh, Mohawk College, the Joyce Center. This building was completed in 2018. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the first buildings in Canada certified under the CAGBC Zero Carbon Building Performance Standard, they were, they were working with a very unique set of conditions to put this net zero, actually, I believe this building is actually operating in a net positive mode, uh, together. Um, they had, they had, the, you know, obviously, you know, energy and carbon targets, net zero energy, net zero carbon. The project schedule was extremely compressed. Uh, the funding commitment was late from the government to this build. And the budget was very much fixed at that point in time. Um, so, you know, there was a, a key decision made at some point uh, of uh, early in, the, in this project to say, we are going to do integrated project delivery. We are going to get all the consultants and the constructors on board from the beginning. Because if we don't, we're never going to be able to successfully deliver the, uh, within the constraints. 
So what did IPD result of in terms of uh, in terms of this building? Well, it actually turned out to be net positive energy as, as it's operating today. It did get the certification for zero carbon. It's got close to passive house levels of thermal performance on the envelope. Uh, it was delivered on time with parallel design and construction activities. I mean, they went to the building permit process like eight, at least five, six, maybe seven times for this building because they were pouring the foundations while they were still designing the building going on top of it because they were under a, a compressed, such a compressed schedule. You could never do that in design bid build. It would be it would be fundamentally impossible to do it in a in, in a consistent in that type of method uh, traditional type of methodology. And they were able to meet the budget. Uh, that that was key. They built this high end institutional high performance net positive building for five hundred dollars a square foot. Now certainly wouldn't be five hundred dollars a square foot today. Construction costs have gone up since twenty eighteen, but. Uh, based on based on my knowledge, uh, you know, like I know I know other universities who are delivering less less sufficient, less spectacular buildings at the same time for about the same cost. So so you know, literally, Mohawk College here got like one of the best buildings in the country for around the same cost as other universities were paying for other institutional buildings. So that's the power of IPD. That's the power of getting away from design bid build and into the integrated project delivery type of methodology. And I will close it out there and pass it over to Eli. Thanks, Josh. I'm gonna actually, uh, we have a question from Eli for you, but I think that's good to ask before we move on and maybe um, give a chance if anyone has any other questions. Um, so Josh, in your experience, what is the lowest project value that delivers positive outcomes for IPD? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question, Eli. I think I'm going to frame the answer in terms of maybe square footage rather than uh, rather than than cost per square foot, um, or you know, trying to get to total project cost. But it's certainly IPD is not going to be applicable for smaller, more commodity type of buildings. Um, you know, like we're not going to build strip malls. Uh, with with IPD, right? That's not where that's not where the value probably lies. Although, I mean, you know, we do have to do a better job on all types of buildings. Uh, but you know, where I think this really needs to start is is the and think about what we're mostly building today. Let's just focus on the mass scale of what we're building. What we're building mostly in Ontario and especially in Toronto is is tall multi residential. Right. We're, we're, we're not we're not building a lot of office buildings. You know, certainly there's municipal buildings. Certainly there's some institutional buildings. But if we talk about the mass market, you know, if we're building a new tall multi-residential building, mid midsize or, or larger, we, we really should be considering I, I, uh, IPD and doing CCD 30 of those. But that's a sector that has never had any experience with that. And 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 uh, Eli, maybe you can comment on this during your part of the presentation. One of the, one of the key unlockers I see is understanding what the uh, uh, limitations are from the development cycle on those types of projects, which you fully understand, and and how we may even need to change the develop the way that the, the developers in the multi res market are typically working in order to make IPD uh, 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 integrate IPD into their development process at least for the next, you know, five to seven, eight years until high performance envelopes are just a commodity item, then we can get back into design bid build. Thanks, Josh. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, any of the audience has a question, feel free. We'll give you a moment here to unmute yourself. Um, go ahead, ask. Do you think the clean energy tax credits that are coming will help the developers see that it's an approach that is competitive with the, you know, uh, lowest first cost? Uh, I mean, David, they 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 can't hurt. Um, obviously, I think the biggest thing that I've seen in those clean energy updated clean energy tax credits is the additional geothermal systems, which I, I believe could receive up to a 30 percent tax credit. Um, I, I, I think one of the challenges is is just to uh, you know follow who who that tax credit falls to and and 
is it is it achievable for any particular like for the for the way that the development or the or the or the project is being done and is it is it achievable back making sure that that is claimable because i don't believe it will be claimable in all situations depending on the structure of the project. yeah also public tendering just uh, you know this whole idea of public tendering get three quotes is still has to be overcome well, you 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 do hit on one point. I mean, I'll let Eli comment on the, the private developer view and uh, in, in multi-res in terms of IPD. But I've heard a roadblock on the public sector side is that um, public sector purchasing processes kind of have to catch up to the idea of IPD, where you're not going out for a tender for design, then you're not going out for a tender for construction, or and then you know a tender for the commissioner. Where where you're literally tendering the project as 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 a holistic project under the in the beginning under a CCDC thirty contract and and going that way so there there definitely is some education on the public sector side too but we have examples Mohawk College uh, the Joyce Center is not the only building in the institutional sector uh, in Ontario that's been built under this methodology absolutely a uh, very good point there um so we have in the savings by design program we've had a, a great number of um, public buildings um, come through the program and um i would say that is absolutely one of the great benefits of savings by design for um for public owned um, construction projects um, to anyone on the line who's from a municipality or regional government. Um, one of the great benefits of it is that it gives you an opportunity to look at how much can you um, sort of front load this thought process before you're putting it out to um, those contracts to um, procurement. Um, and certainly that's a, a much larger issue. Um, yeah, so thanks for raising that. Um, I just want to note one other thing. We're going to hand things over um, to Eli Miller from Hallmark, but I just wanted to note one thing that um, I omitted in my introduction there, but that Josh and Dave both um, talked about quite a great deal is IP, IDP has, it's been around for a little while now, and it's starting to be integrated into company processes. So there are a lot of um, architectural and engineering and design firms that are um, including this so that within their own team, it's part of their process. But what we've seen with the Savings by Design program is that it, the greatest benefit is when you're able to bring in people from outside the immediate design team, because that's when you start to really get um, you start to really be critical of design elements that perhaps um, were sort of wrote, I suppose. Everyone has different assumptions going into a design um, and having those assumptions challenged by people who don't um, have the same worldview when you're going into the design process is really, really helpful. So with that, I'm going to ask Eli um, to give us an overview of another successful program um, project, which is in the 80 Atlantic building. Thanks, Adam. And uh, thanks for the invite to speak on this, this webinar. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, fantastic to hear from, from all the subject matter experts. And, and uh, this is a great program that Hallmark uh, fully endorses. And in fact, all buildings that qualify, we go through the savings by design program. Uh, and that's something that we committed to uh, coming out of our experience on 80 Atlantic uh, a number of years ago going on, I believe we participated in 2015. Uh, next slide, please, Adam. Uh, so who's a Hallmark? Hallmark is an active owner, operator, developer of, of uh, real estate within the downtown core of Toronto. Our portfolio is, is hyper-focused between, generally speaking, uh, Dufferin and uh, the DVP, and generally around Kane and Queen Street. So we have a very urban intensive focus uh, and we have a variety of assets spanning all asset classes. Um, but one thing that really matters to us is integrating well into the built form and ensure that we're contributing to a positive uh, built form and community environment within the city of Toronto. Next slide please, Adam. Uh, 80 Atlantic. Um, I, 
I could speak for hours. I only have 10 minutes, so I'll try to keep this brief. There's a couple of um, sort of representative photos here. One is this site actually started with a, an existing brick and beam building at 60 Atlantic that we renovated uh, under our phase one of the project. And phase two was, a, was actually a parking lot. And this, this project proceeded without any rezoning because we had uh, available density on site. So very, very unique process in that, you know, this was achieved, the, the zoning was achieved through minor variance um, because the in-place density was already there. Um, so this is really looked at as a complex uh, of 1680 Atlantic. And when we moved into the design for 80 Atlantic, the inspiration was how do we achieve the look and feel of brick and beam uh, in the modern context? So, you know, how do we achieve that high ceiling look, open floor plate, um, exposed natural wood elements. Um, those were really the initial the initial objectives. And then also, how do we create this engaging courtyard area? And if anyone has been in Liberty Village around the site, I think you know what's what's really special is seeing this area activated um, and the vibrancy within it. Next slide, please, Adam. So I'll speak about some of the um, uh, achievements that we had on 80 Atlantic. So uh, this was the first commercial mass timber building. Um, that achieved a building permit and occupancy under the revised 2015 code um, uh, allowances, uh, permitting mass timber up to six stories. Um, I, I have done probably about, I don't know, 150 tours of the building. And one of my sort of canned um, go-to responses is that we were first and innovation is very expensive um, and very challenging. And, and a lot of what we were doing through the process was um, helping educate, you know, both ourselves, our consultant partners, the city, uh, our construction partners, and working together to, to figure out how we navigate this, this updated um, construction technology. Uh, so 80 Atlantic is 85,000 square feet. It's a five-story mass timber construction, four floors of open office space, retail at grade, and two level, levels of underground parking. Um, we were successful in achieving the Governor General's Award for Architecture in 2022. The building has achieved an operational BOMA Best Platinum Certification, as well as Fitwell One Star Rating. Next slide, please, Adam. So when we started, I, I, I was going through some of the, the, um, the charrette reports, and this quote really uh, spoke to me and I think is, is, is sort of the essence of what SBC is trying to do, and I think does an excellent job helping the industry get there, which is design it right, build it right, run it right. Um, how, so another goal was to meet or exceed the energy performance of, of savings by design, uh, which is 25% more efficient than the SB10 reference building. Uh, we were aiming to, to comply with TGS tier two um, with the development. We want a content inspired design. We wanted it to be future proof, with flexible floor plans. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're here to build cool, attractive, interesting buildings. So those were how we started. Next slide, please, Adam. Okay, what did we do? So how did we how did we actually get there? So what did so we participated in our charrette? We had a number of measures. Um, I'll kind of bounce around a bit here, but uh, we upgraded all the ERV, uh, ERVs to achieve a 89% effectiveness. Um, keeping in mind, this was done in 2015, so some of this might appear to be table stakes now, but at that time it was, you know, on the edge, which, you know, and again, LED lighting in parking garages, I think that would be a pretty common thing uh, this day and age. But at that time, that was an implemented measure that, that achieved some significant savings. We had started the project assessing on a triple glaze system, and through the saving by design charrette, we actually proved out that we could achieve the same performance by using a double glaze system rather than, than incurring the added cost of going to a triple glaze system. Um, other considerations that, that we captured through the charrette process, a high focus on indoor air quality, tenant engagement, as well as stormwater management. Um, next slide, please, Adam. Oh, sorry, back one slide, my mistake. Um, just on indoor air quality, there are a couple of points that I wanted to make. So we, we participated in a full building air tightness testing, which was not a requirement at that time, but something that we felt strongly about to add to you know, the overall sustainability and quality of construction. Um, and that, that achieved the 
Army Corps of Engineers um, uh, standard rating, uh, which I believe is what the current uh, City of Toronto standard is based on. Um, this building was, was built and occupied um, up from around 2017, and we had achieved full occupancy and com total completion in June of 2020. So obviously a very challenging time to deliver a project in, um, but we felt the importance of um, the air tightness testing would prove out and, and ensure a quality built product and deliver on our, on our obligations that, that we committed to through savings by design. Um, we committed to doing an, an integrated a raised access floor system, uh, complete with underfloor air distribution. So again, that allowed us to back off some of the, the fan requirements and create this more natural passive ventilation system, um, coupled with uh, a number of operable windows within the facility to give that tenant comfort uh, when, we, when you do have those more favorable conditions outdoors. Um, we also had participated in a, in a robust commissioning process, uh, followed by a retroactive or a post-construction commissioning uh, process, as well as a building analytics uh, platform that we integrated into our ongoing operations. Uh, as far as tenant engagement goes, um, our, we, have, we have three tenants um, within the building. We have been actively working with them through their occupancy and helping them understand how to use the space. Obviously with mass timber, um, humidity control is critically important to ensure that integrity of the structure remains. Um, so that's been a, a, a sort of ongoing working with our, with our tenant partners uh, to help them understand how they get the best use out of their space. Coupled with the analytics platform, we're able to, to provide insights into how the building's operating and help them uh, within their operation for their space. Uh, stormwater management, again, large green roof system uh, and rainwater harvesting for irrigation. Again, 2015, these were right on the leading edge of, of uh, you know, strategies. Now, obviously, much more, much more driven by, by you know, the need um, and the requirements of the city. Um, Next slide, please, Adam. One last thing I wanted to touch on was that, you know, we had, we had um, the initial objective was obviously to beat uh, the reference building by 25% on the energy target. Coming out of our initial charrette, we actually had achieved a 30% reduction. And through our BOMA Best Platinum certification, we've landed in an operational metric around 27% better than um, better than the, the reference building. So I think what that tells us is that, you know, we designed it right, we built it right, and we're running it right. So if this is an example of, of uh, you know, the successful delivery of a project uh, through the Savings by Design program, I'm not sure what is because the outcomes have been significant, uh, both in energy performance, but then also in, in the design aspects, and then as well as engagement from the broader sustainability construction development um, communities. So any questions? Thank you, Eli. That was a great overview of the building. Um, does anyone have any questions for Eli? Or uh, since we're, we're sort of in the last few minutes of the webinar, if you have any questions for anyone else as well, now is a, a good time. Uh, we'll just give everyone a moment. Feel free to unmute yourself and uh, just jump right in. This is David Katz again. How are we going to incorporate renewables and and uh, you know in the whole building envelope and uh, uh, built-in photovoltaics, uh, transactive energy, grid-connected buildings? Where does that fit in? Um, I'll uh, I'll take that one. If anybody else wants to chime in, so like we, you know, the way that we look at renewables uh, at least in terms of savings by design and and you know even myself more systematically is is that they're they're a great addition to a building um you know where you know it obviously starts typically with rooftop solar which is the most cost effective and then kind of moves into the building integrated solar um but and we need to do more of that um but but we kind of have to realize at the same time that the you know, the return on investment on solar is 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 driven by 
you know, the, obviously how much you can generate on the building and the cost, but also, you know, the cost of electricity in the province as well. So like right now, you know, you'd expect a typical solar projects, uh, rooftop based and, you know, maybe even parking lot based to be somewhere in that eight to 12 year payback with tax credits. Building integrated solar is going to be longer, longer paybacks than that. Um, we do need to do more of it, but at the same time, we can't use solar. We can't just put solar on a building and then have run the building inefficiently. So we really need to look at those as 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 two different and 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 separate items. And Adam, 100%. I, don't know if I, I you know that I'm I'm even even if ten Teslas go and park in the parking lot under this building, are they able to charge given what Toronto Hydro's capacity is? So. Uh, I just, on behalf of Ontario Sustainable Energy Association, we're looking at a focus as to how do we bring sustainable energy into the build, into the rebuild, into the renovate, and uh, hopefully there is carbon pricing and tax credits coming, subject mm. to the upcoming elections, as you can well imagine. Thanks. Did you have anything to say about that, Adam? No, I, I think you covered it all. I, that is uh, very good comments all around. It is it is certainly not as simple as just slapping solar panels on at the end. Any other any other questions? Well, it looks like uh, we've done such a good job, everyone, uh, that there are no questions. I will remind everyone that you can reach out to us at any time. If you have follow-up, we'll be sending out an email um, with uh, contact information, with the recording from this, and um, possibly we'll, we'll include the, the slide deck as well so everyone can um, review that. Um, now, I just wanted to loop back um, to Enbridge. Um, Vinoth is still on the line. We'll see, Vinoth, if you have any closing comments. I just wanted to tip our hat um, here to Alex Colvin, who is uh, Vinoth's counterpart at Enbridge Gas um, with the Affordable Housing Program. Um, this, uh, this format for the webinar today was developed based on his panel discussion with Josh and Dave and uh, Raimondo, uh, Emilio Raimondo um, at the Ontario Architects uh, or so Ontario Association of Architects um, conference. So thanks to Alex uh, for all of his work putting this together as well. And um, Vinoth, did you have any final comments? Uh, no, I just wanna say thank you everyone for participating. Thanks to all our speakers for taking some time today as well. Um, and <clears throat> the program does have some openings left for the remainder of the year. So if you do have some projects that you're considering this pro for, uh, reach out and uh, yeah, we can talk more about it further. Excellent, thanks for Nathan. Um, uh, thank you to to Josh, Dave, Larry, Eli for taking the time um, to to present today. Um, we, we get a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information out there. So it's really nice to have experts take the time and try to help us focus on what is important. And thank you all. With that, we'll sign off. Uh, we'll see everybody soon. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.